around the meter. Uh, but then when you want to start learning about uh, ecological interactions, uh, single cell physiology, and so things that occur at lower scales uh, uh, than uh, approaches like sequencing become uh, less powerful. And so, so ad to address those, uh, uh, we use uh, one of the possibilities is using direct uh, observations with microscopy. And here you see uh, uh, some examples uh, uh, of samples taken ex vivo uh, from uh, muscle gills, uh, the mouse gut, uh, and, uh, and the tooth. And um, you can tell uh, of this, uh, of this uh, great variability between species and uh, the importance uh, that the space, the sp spatial dimensions, have on the coexistence of these microbes. And these studies uh, also contributed to reveal that uh, uh, the organization of these polymicrobial communities and uh, their function uh, are linked. And uh, specifically, I would like to point you uh, to, and, and to point, I guess, at least the mouse this time, um, to, to these communities at the bottom. I know I have a pointer. I, I just prefer the mouse. <laughs> um, so some of these communities uh, are rounded. Uh, some others have these uh, finger-like uh, uh, shapes. Uh, and uh, in this particular work, uh, they managed uh, uh, to, to show that uh, the round ones are less prone to cause cavities than the finger-like ones. OK. Uh, those were ex vivo examples, so um, it's quite hard to test hypotheses uh, with those, uh, and um, uh, they're also incredibly hard uh, to come by. Uh, one uh, solution that sort of uh, strikes a, a trade off between complexity and uh, hypothesis testing is to use uh, models. And so uh, here you see a transparent uh, model system uh, on the top. And uh, uh, you see uh, microfluidics uh, uh, approaches uh, uh, that can also go by the name of infection on chips, in which uh, people try to mimic structures of animals. And here you see ve blood vessels infected at the bottom, and uh, their mimics in microfluidics at the top. So this is uh, probably an approach uh, that uh, uh, is the future, but it is still uh, quite technically uh, challenging. Uh, also because you need to keep happy the host uh, and all of these uh, members of the community at the same time. Um, and so my uh, approach to, uh, again, uh, whittle down a little bit uh, uh, complexity and, and still uh, look at polymicrobial communities uh, and test hypotheses is to use, uh, is to build the polymicrobial communities from the bottom up and look at them in microfluidics. I use pathogenic uh, polymicrobial communities, which are relevant uh, uh, and found uh, in infected airways, infected wounds, uh, and with some changes uh, uh, in UTIs too. And specifically, I build this uh, community um, using uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which in my talk would be in blue, fluorescence blue, um, Staph aureus will be in green, and Candida albicans, which will be in red. Uh, you see that these span a quite a range in dimensions, and they also span quite a range of the tree of life. Um, I, like I said, I put them into microfluidics uh, and uh, in the microscope. And uh, I try to divide and conquer the problem into causes. So what are the causes that lead to the emergence of a certain organization in a community, and what are the consequences? And uh, among the causes that, that, that I um, uh, have individuated are the biotic causes, the um, uh, space, what is the role of chemicals, uh, and what is the role of time. And then once these uh, different uh, communities uh, have organized with, with different organizations, they will have uh, perhaps distinct biophysical properties, different virulence, and they will respond differently to treatment. Okay. Um, I uh, focus uh, on uh, two main approaches. Uh, uh, one is uh, um, a, a, an arena in microfluidics uh, um, in which this, th 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 there are many, many pockets uh, of spaces which are modeled in size uh, on uh, alveoli and, uh, and that I call the eye. These are all microconnected and uh, I wink at uh, Bob Austin uh, in, in for this particular design. Uh, but today, uh, 
uh, we're not, I'm, I'm not going to talk about those. I will talk uh, about uh, something else, which is the family machine, which is something that I guess was born in the legacy of the mother machine. And uh, I guess for this, uh, I'll link uh, to Gabriele Michali. Um, the idea of this uh, is that it's a tube with uh, pockets on the side. Uh, the tube wants to represent uh, lower airways, and the, the uh, boxes, the pockets, want to uh, represent alveoli. And uh, so I, um, the, 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 the tube is about one centimeter long, and these pockets are modeled roughly on the sizes of, of alveoli, 100 micron, um, but they are only 8 micron thick. And the reason for this is that this allows me to work in a quasi 2D situation, and so allows me not to use confocal microscopy. Um, I uh, let the community into these pockets, and then I let the community grow using artificial sputum medium. Remember, we are in the respiratory tract uh, uh, mimics. Um, and then I let it uh, develop, and when it develops, uh, it does something like that. Uh, you will see more videos in a second. Um, the, one of the first results, you will see uh, there is really a zoo of, of, of uh, behaviors uh, when you put these, these species together, and uh, there is, uh, therefore, a certain level of complexity, which I hope is not too much, and so we, we can still learn, still learn from it. Um, and uh, one, two macro phenotypes that emerge from these communities depend on the abundance, uh, and specifically the initial abundance of the, of the species. Uh, remember the color code uh, that I mentioned before. And so when the Candida albicans is in uh, low titer compared to the Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, uh, something like this will happen. And so you see that the Staphorius essentially disappears, uh, and uh, the whole space is dominated uh, by the Pseudomonas and uh, uh, is interspersed by uh, Candida in its Eiffel uh, uh, form. The Candida is uh, sort of uh, uh, blocked inside this, this mass uh, of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In the other case, uh, in which the Candida is much more than the Pseudomonas, uh, well, something different happens. Oh, no. Okay. No, not okay. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. So now you see that if the candida is a lot more, now the candida goes eyeful very quickly. It occupies the sides. It will scoop off everything that's in the, in the pocket, and everything gets uh, carried away. Um, and, and, and this is a, a way different behavior, and uh, you can imagine is also very importantly different from a clinical perspective, right? If these are alveoli, of course this is an approximation. Uh, if these were alveoli, well then uh, the, the community will be significantly different in the two cases. Um, uh, this is on the shorter time scales. If we move on to the longer time scales, then other uh, sort of uh, uh, behaviors uh, um, start to be important, and for example, adhesion, and here you can see adhesion on the left uh, with uh, all of these uh, per pearly white uh, uh, um, cells uh, um, being on top of the hyphae of the candida, um, and uh, if you now focus on this part of the screen, you will see that over time, uh, inside the tube, biofilms will become so prevalent, so large, that they will start behaving as a unit, uh, not minding anymore uh, the pocket. Yeah? Okay. So, if you focus on this side, you will see that uh, parts of the pocket, there you go, will start coming off as a single unit, right? So those indicate that there is some mechanical connection, and on these longer time scales, uh, the, the, the whole thing comes off as something different. You cannot really study the pocket anymore. When that happens, uh, when that happens, uh, this should play, okay. Yeah, when that happens, uh, the candida comes off, uh, and now motility becomes important. The Pseudomonas is the only motile species, and so it can now occupy uh, the space uh, and take over. So these uh, become important at a later, later stage. Um, 
Of course, there is a range of other uh, things that change the organization of these communities. And now my purpose is to really give you a very, very quick flavor uh, taster of it. Uh, one, one example is antibiotics. If you use antibiotics that target uh, not the candida, um, but, but they, they, the, the staph aureus and the pseudomonas are susceptible to this, uh, then you start having a completely different uh, uh, behavior. And here you see the candida stopping its eiffel growth, uh, reverting to its yeast form, and uh, it grows in a way that's completely different. Um, uh, you see some jamming at the top of the well, and uh, uh, we also know that uh, the yeast forms uh, of candida are less virulent uh, than Eiffel. And inter interestingly, this is a behavior that you only start seeing if the other members of the community have died due to the antibiotic. Uh, it's not a behavior that you see if you give the antibiotic to the candida. And so this indicates that perhaps uh, there is something um, in the treatment of a community that makes one species in the community different, okay? Um, other examples uh, of factors that change the behavior, well, temperature. Uh, on the left, you have uh, a lower temperature with uh, a combination uh, or a polymicrobial community, and you see how different it now is compared to before. If you remove the pseudomonas, uh, if you remove the pseudomonas, uh, these videos are too big. I guess we'll do without. Okay, if you remo re remove the pseudomonas, you will have to trust me, things are also quite different. Okay, so now um, you will have thought, uh, these are very complicated samples, uh, how does one analyze them? Well, one simple approach uh, in the uh, left case. Oh no. Okay, in the leftmost case, one simple, uh, um, one, one approach is to just uh, quantify total fluorescence, and that works quite well when all of your species stay fluorescent. Um, in another case, like the one that you have over here, I guess we need a stronger computer. Uh, in this case, you see that the candida, uh, when it goes eyeful and grows very quickly, it stops being red, and, uh, and so it, it becomes impossible to tell it's tighter just by fluorescence, and so one needs to find uh, different strategies. And so I use a combination of strategies to try and quantify and place uh, the different uh, members of the community. And obviously I have to start from uh, automated box extraction. And then I use morphological segmentation approaches to extract the position and the quantity of the species. I then can extract uh, growth rate by pixel correlations. And uh, I can then, since nematic domains appear at the edges, I can also uh, uh, try and extract them using uh, object uh, uh, orientation. Um, to try and uh, better understand what's going on and how much of it depends on uh, mechanics and growth rates alone, I also teamed up uh, uh, with uh, um, Adam Brown and uh, uh, Bartek Woksak. Uh, work clubs in, uh, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, they use uh, agent-based uh, modeling, and so we're trying to understand whether uh, 2D shapes alone can lead uh, to the formation of the different uh, organizations that uh, I've showed you. Eventually, the goal is to uh, um, endow the systems uh, with reporters of gene expression, uh, and, and for the uh, gene nerds among you, you can uh, read uh, some examples of, of the interesting genes and operands, um, and we can uh, also endow them with reporters of cell physiology, uh, such as uh, the membrane voltage, cytoplasmic pH, the ATP, to try and understand what are the factors that lead to different organizations. Uh, eventually, the goal uh, is to understand how these different organizations lead to different biophysical properties, and here you see 
a streamer developing in flow, and so again with microfluidics, uh, and using different uh, amounts of flow, one can test the uh, mechanical properties of, of the communities. Uh, still in microfluidics, one can test their adhesion and uh, their microbiology, their uh, microbiological properties. Uh, one can test uh, their virulence uh, using, for example, macrophages uh, or their capability to survive treatment using antibiotics. Uh, eventually, the goal is to ex Pardon? Yeah, this is it. Um, eventually, the goal uh, is to spread uh, uh, the, the, the research to other kinds of communities, uh, both uh, in the infection and microbiome, and, uh, and uh, in, the, in the environment. Uh, so with this, I thank the people that um, uh, helped me in this endeavor, Pietro Martineva, Aidan, and Bartek, and I'm always open to collaborate, so if you'd like to collaborate, please talk to me. Thank you. Maybe we can have a one quick question. Um, yes. artificial sputum medium, and uh, it's uh, continuously perfused uh, in the channel. So um, the conditions tend to be fairly uh, stable throughout the experiment. Then uh, through the pocket, uh, that's a different story, and it's something that's definitely interesting uh, to look at. So in the medium, for sure, there are Eiffel-inducing uh, candles. OK, so let's thank Leonardo again. Uh... Uh, um, now we can welcome uh, the next speaker, which uh, is uh, Abhishek uh, Vaidyat Nathan. So hello guys, uh, pleasure to be talking to you all today. Uh, today uh, I will be talking a, a little bit about the work that I have been doing over the last one and a half years. And the main focus of my work is to develop theoretical models to explain amino acid crossfeeding in bacteria. So what is crossfeeding? Uh, I mean, as the name suggests, it is some kind of a barter system. You produce something that I want, I produce something that you want, and we exchange these things. This is something that is ubiquitous in bacterial communities. In fact, uh, and uh, today we will be talking about amino acid crossfeeding. And when it comes to amino acids, you, have, you can categorize bacteria into two broad uh, types. You have the prototrophs that are self-sufficient, and they can produce all the amino acids that they require. And then you have the oxytrophs, which cannot produce one or more amino acids. So, and oxytrophy is a very, very common thing. In fact, it is more rule than the exception. And uh, most real communities, uh, most bacteria in most real communities uh, are oxytrophic for at least one amino acid, as, as shown in this study. So now I'm going to do something risky and try to play a movie. Uh, so this was an experiment done by Constantinos, a postdoc in our group. On the left, you have an oxytroph oxytroph system, and on the right, you have a prototroph oxytroph system. Yeah. And uh, you can see that uh, on the left, the, the two oxytrophs grow with each other quite well, and especially if they're close to each other, they grow very well. But you can see in the prototroph oxytroph system, which is here, the prototroph is growing quite well, but the oxytroph basically suspends growth. So, why is this happening, and what's I mean, what's exactly going on here? And why are the oxytrophs performing better with another oxytroph rather than with a prototroph? 
Now, uh, this is one of the questions that I aim to answer, hopefully more, with the work that I have done. And this comes to the central question and the method that I'm using to address this uh, phenomena. So now you have cross-feeding, which describes interactions. It talks about how communities manage resources. But unfortunately, as of yet, we do not have a mechanistic explanation for uh, how much cross-feeders grow in different nutrient conditions. On the other hand, you have a seemingly unrelated thing, which is the proteome sector model, which was alluded to yesterday by a few speakers, where bacteria regulate their physiology by changing their expression of different parts of the proteome. And this also talks about how individuals utilize resources. And this does have a relatively better uh, mechanistic explanation for how they grow in different nutrient conditions. The thing is, both of them talk about how resources are managed and utilized by bacteria. So maybe we can use the language from the proteome sector theory to, okay, do this, to model cross-feeding in bacteria. So this is basically the big bad flux model that I have constructed. And it's actually not that, it's not that bad, it's basically uh, what the bacteria is doing. It's, I'm modeling the bacteria as a factory that produces proteins. You have a carbon source, a nitrogen source, an amino acid source, the, the protein outflux, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and antibiotic inhibition. You also have a regulatory switch, which uh, chooses which protein to produce at what point of time. And uh, this basically, yeah, to uh, ensure optimal growth. And in an oxytroph, one biosynthesis flux is removed because it cannot synthesize these amino acids. So I simulate this system and I, uh, I see what are the, uh, how the fluxes move, how the pools move, and so on and so forth. And I realize th that uh, we can actually sort of explain this weird phenomena where a, an oxytroph oxytroph system works better than a prototroph oxytroph system if we make the regulatory switch a little bit inefficient and noisy, and here you can see that the growth of the oxytroph along with the prototroph, I mean, I have normalized the growth rates with respect to the prototroph. You can see that this is much, much lower compared to the growth rates of an oxytroph oxytroph system. Uh, this is still a work in progress. I still need to quantify this uh, more, and this is pretty much it. Uh, all perfectly on time. Thank you. So yes, uh, 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 send me an email. Uh, and uh, thank you to all my collaborators and friends from different places. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you. OK, if there's no questions, we can welcome the next speaker, Emanuele Pigani. So, good afternoon. My name is Emanuele Pigani, I'm a PhD student. And today I will uh, briefly discuss about a paper that we just published on uh, neutral theory, species abundant distribution, and uh, dieton communities. So, to begin with, let's introduce what is a species abundant distribution, so SAD in the following. Basically, it's just a, a distribution of the number of species that have a given abundance in a community. So you just count the individuals in the community and you make an histogram. And as you can see here, even for very different ecosystems, so from tropical forests to coral reefs to diatom communities, you observe similar uh, behavior, similar pattern. And this, among other uh, similarities, uh, suggests that maybe there exists some few fundamental mechanisms that somehow underpin such patterns. And of course, there are uh, many possible explanations for uh, these uh, behaviors, but let me just mention the neutral theory that has already been mentioned this morning, um, because basically it's at the topic of, the, of our paper. So if we focus on uh, a single trophic level and we consider the species to be equivalent in competition, 
then we can uh, explain the differences that we observe in the abundances just by means of uh, stochasticity. And uh, as you can see, it uh, works pretty well for many ecosystems, but now we want to, to see if uh, this theory applies also to diatoms. And why diatoms? So first of all, because they are important, uh, just to give you two numbers, they are responsible for more than 20% of the oxygen production, and they are huge in terms of biomass, more than you can really think about it. And also because they are ocean-wide distributed. And this feature allows for a fair comparison between different temperatures, different latitudes, and so on. So for this reason, we leverage the data from the Tara Ocean datasets, which uh, have um, almost 200 samples, and we use the uh, OTU-based uh, classification. So the idea was to, to start with a, a very simple analysis on the, so you can make uh, histograms like this one, and then you can compare them uh, for all the stations. And here I reported uh, the, this plot by coloring the, the data, the station, by their uh, temperature. As you can see, on the one hand, uh, the most abundant ones are the coldest one, and this is something that we can expect for uh, uh, from the biology of diatoms. But at the same time, all the station closely aligned to a single power law with the same exponent. And uh, this observation motivated us uh, to formulate uh, a neutral sampling framework uh, in which we wanted to test uh, a very precise hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that there exists uh, a unique uh, global uh, ocean-wide uh, meta-community that is like a thermal buff uh, for uh, diatoms, and then uh, when we sample, the, the, when, we, when we go in the ocean and we sample, basically we are just sampling from this thermal buff. And to be more precise, basically, so as I said, the hypothesis is to, to consider a neutral model for the meta community, and then we can derive uh, the SAD, theoretically. And then we, we assume that we are just sampling from this, and the, the only parameter that is relevant is this sampling ratio, which is just the volume of water that we are sampling. Of course, in principle, if we knew all the, all the parameters, here we should uh, give an explanation and an expectation for the, um, for the local SAD, but of course we don't have access to these parameters. So we propose a way to overcome this uh, lack of knowledge, and basically we assume that uh, the, the SAD can be approximated to a power law, and since the power law is scale invariant, also the local SAD are power laws, as you, uh, as you saw in the data. And by making a further assumption, which is reasonable, so just assuming that the sampling ratio is very small, we can give a prediction for the number of species, so the richness as a function of the total abundance. So if you, if you tell me how many individuals you have in a community, I will tell you how many different species uh, you have. And uh, this allows, so here I have just reported the scaling between richness and total abundance, which works pretty well. And also you can predict uh, the richness from the properties of uh, a station. It works pretty well, but at the same time, if you look at the deviation, you, see, you can clearly see a deviation that uh, carry a biogeographical bio imprinting, and so in a word, the data do not support the hypothesis of a neutral meta community. And that's all, so if you are interested, I will be more than happy to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Questions? Yes. Can you, can you Yes. Uh, no, no. We just we just focus on uh, OTUs. Uh, yeah, because I mean, uh, so here we are uh, we are filtering the data. So you have basically the data are, are uh, divided by uh, by size of the of the um, taxonomical size, and from the taxonomical size uh, we just filter the diatoms. They are not very much, so you cannot. Uh, if you coarse grain them, basically you, you don't, you cannot see a distribution because you have two men to, uh, yes. One last short question. Yeah, because, yes, uh, thanks for the question. So basically because uh, uh, the, the deviations are due only, are mainly due to the hyperdominant species so the one you observe in the right tail, sorry, which uh, basically do not affect the distribution. Okay, we can thank the speaker again.
Welcome uh, uh, Milena Chakraverti Wurtwein. Um, hi, I'm Milena, and I'm a graduate student at University of Chicago. Um, and I uh, am going to talk to you about a project that I've been working on with Arvind Murrigan. Um, and I'm sort of hoping more to frame a question and less show you maybe the answers to the question. Um, so please do come talk to me afterwards if you're interested in hearing more. Um, so the question that I'm broadly interested in is surrounding sort of how might microbial community growth patterns impact robustness, um, but more particularly what we've been looking at is how a reduction in sort of co-growth or how much different microbes in a community grow at the same time versus at different times, how that might increase robustness of these incredibly complex communities when subject to noise. Um, so to sort of motivate this a little bit, I want to bring your attention to an observation, which is that many bacterial communities exhibit successional growth patterns. So on the left, you can see sort of a cartoon showing abundance over time. And what I mean by successional growth is basically that for multiple microbes within the community, they're growing one after the other. So here you see sort of yellow is growing first, then green, then blue. And the abundances, you know, the final abundances may be different, but what's important is really those time windows in which growth is happening. On the right-hand side, you see actual sort of um, data evidence of this happening in marine bacterial communities. Um, this is from uh, work in 2016 by Otto Cordero's group. And you can see through this heat map where uh, rows are sort of, you can imagine bacterial species or taxa, um, and uh, the columns are time. And we can see sort of um, that as you move across in time, you have sort of some taxar growing, then some others, and then some later on further. Many people have studied sort of how this is happening. What are all of the complicated mechanisms, cross-feeding, et cetera. Um, but what I'm really interested in is why might this kind of ecological growth pattern arise in these complex ecosystems? Um, and sort of the answer, or one of the answers that we think might be contributing to this is this fact that when you have different types of microbes growing in different periods, you are increasing the robustness. Um, so what I mean by this is our system, and this is all sort of the work that I'm doing is in simulations, is imagining, suppose we have um, sort of an initial colonization by a bunch of different microbes on some patch. That patch has all of the nutrients, the resources, et cetera, that you need. And over the course of sort of a growth cycle, your microbes are growing, competing, helping each other, whatever the complicated mechanism may be, but depleting those nutrients. And once those nutrients are depleted, they have the opportunity to disperse to new patches. And in that dispersal step, there are fluctuations. In other words, you may not have a reliable number of how many of these microbes are going every single time to a new patch. Um, so, you know, sometimes you might have a couple of brown, uh, one yellow and two green, but then another time you may have fewer brown and um, more green. Now, over many, many of these growth cycles, these fluctuations not allowing for invasions will cause sort of the extinction of some of these species. And this is what we're sort of talking about as robustness of the community. How many cycles will happen until this community collapse? So um, just sort of a cartoon of the results that we're looking at is that as you have an increase in the robustness, in other words, longer community lifetimes, um, you'll see less co-growth. In other words, how much the microbes are growing in the same time period will decrease. Um, so yeah, talk to me more if you want to see the actual results and simulations. For a few questions. Yeah. So I'm curious how you model this. You just treat these as pairwise interactions and conventional covariates, or actually you have more complex patterns of interactions among the microbes when you model them? 
Yeah, so we've been working basically trying to choose complex models that exist in um, in literature. So one model in particular we were using was uh, looking at sort of a system of sort of spatial patterning that happens due to chemotaxis. Um, and we, we allow all of the complexity of what's actually happening in experimental systems and then ask ourselves, okay, if I allow, if I seed many communities with different strategies, so let's say in this case of the chemotactic system, we allow for different swimming rates and different sort of growth rates, um, which of those communities will be more robust um, by this measure? And then looking at sort of this metric also of co-growth. So, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so um, at the moment we have been looking, we've started this looking at just pairwise, uh, but we're interested in expanding this to um, sort of larger communities and um, hopefully figuring out how do we define sort of similar things in a non pairwise way. Okay. Um, Let, let's thank uh, Milena again. We're taking over poster session. So um, let's welcome the next speaker, uh, Swenin Zhou. Uh, you're, you're here, no? Hello, everyone. My name is Xuanyu. Um, I'm a PhD candidate working in Dr. Renita Gordon's lab at UT Austin. We study a lot of bacteria biophysics. Um, and today I'm here to introduce my project studying the incorporated collagen in bacteria biofilms. So you may ask, what is a biofilm? Um, biofilms are a community of microbes um, that's surrounded by uh, extracellular polymers. Um, they are the major cause of chronic infections in humans, and they are tolerant to antibiotics and mechanical stress and to immune system. And that's why we study it, because it's important and it's, and it's hard to treat. And um, when the bacteria get a chance, they will try to infect you and form a biofilm. And bacteria are everywhere, you know, right in the air, like right, right here. So um, it's better to know them before they know you, right? Um, so why is biofilm so strong? Because the biofilms are uh, protected by the polymers. Um, so uh, there is a thing called polymer matrix in biofilms, and uh, it's formed by a lot of different polymers um, that can be produced by the bacteria or can come from the environment. For example, they can take your protein and DNA to be a part of their biofilms. Um, I want to know that different species of bacteria can make completely different polymers. So those are several bacteria we are using in our lab, the Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus. Um, those are two strains that's very common in the environment. They are in the water, in the soil, on your skin, and in your bathroom. So um, they are closely related to you. Um, and this Vercodaria is not a very common um, organism. It's uh, epidem epidemic uh, in tropical and subtropical areas. But there's a case that um, in United States, um, there's uh, people bought tropical fish from pet, pet shop and then get this uh, meliodosis. So it's also related to you. Um, and the polymers produced by Pseudomonas are negatively charged or neutral. I mentioned this because um, the charge of the polymers can affect the interaction of those polymers with your polymers. Um, so the polymers can interact um, by chemical binding or by um, electrostatic interaction. Um, and staff uh, produce a positively charged um, poly polysaccharides and Burke produce also negative charge polysaccharides. So those are the pictures. I know they are really gross, but. Um, and for the polymer um, they get from you, um, we call it a host-derived material. Um, for example, collagen. 
So collagen is the most abundant protein in you, and it's right under your skin, like right here. And it supports your structure um, and tissue, and it's essential um, when there is a wound or a burn. It's essential for the healing process. And our previous work with our collaborators have shown that collagen from animals can be incorporated into pseudomonas biofoam, and that will increase biofoam elasticity. Um, so we wonder why would biofoams take collagen from you? And the hypothesis is, is um, they want to take your material to protect themselves against your immune system. Um, talking about immune system, um, one important component is uh, neutrophil. So neutrophils are the most common white blood cells in your blood, and um, they can engulf those um, external particles, um, for example, bacteria in your blood, um, into this uh, in, in this phagosome and then digest it inside it. Um, so it's a very common way for neutrophils to to clear pathogens and. Um, is vital for the immune system. But uh, what if the tar target is bigger than the neutrophil? Um, this is a photo of neutrophil on the top of a bacterial biofilm. So they are trying to, trying to eat bacteria from the biofilm. Um, so you can see here, this, this network, this big network it are biofilms. They're like composed of polymers and bacteria. And those wrong thing, those are neutrophils. Um, isolated from human blood. Um, and this small thing, I have to magnify it or you won't be able to see it. Um, those are bacteria. So it's easy for neutrophils to engulf bacteria, but um, for biofilms, what they can do is they will try to bite uh, bacteria off from the biofilms. Um, and this process depends on the mechanics of biofilms. Um, for example, the elasticity. It's calculated by uh, stress and strain. Um, and our previous study found that for larger targets, um, higher elasticity will decrease the ability of phagocytosis. So the harder um, a, a structure is, the, um, uh, the harder for neutrophils to eat them. Um, Oh, and the neutrophils we use in the, in the experiments are isolated from human. Um, so human blood is, uh, it, is centrifugated. In, oh, okay. oh. So human blood is uh, separated by centrifugation, and after uh, the isolation process, we can get a solution that contains all and hope human neutrophils. Um, and the blood comes from volunteers every time we need to draw fresh new blood, so I call it the Blood Thirsty Project. <laughs> mm. And we use those neutrophils to set up uh, engulfment assay. Um, basically, we, we um, incubate the neutrophils with biofilms for 30 minutes to allow the neutrophils to engulf, bio, uh, engulf bacteria, and then we examine um, how many neutrophils have actually got bacteria inside it. We calculate the engulfment success rate by the number of neutrophils that has bacteria divided by all neutrophils. And the biofilms I use uh, in the experiments are set up uh, in like many three ways. So the control is just biofilm, nothing, just pure biofilm. And uh, there's biofilm grown with collagen. So collagen are incorporated into it. And, um, and there's a, a, a treaty group that's grown with collagen and then treated with collagenase. Um, so collagenase is an enzyme that can break down the collagen. And the result is, so um, the solid bars right here, so those are different strains. Um, and like those are like solid bars from one strain. You can see as the collagen concentration increase, the engulfment success will decrease. Um, and the striped bars are treated, but, uh, treated with enzyme. So um, it goes back up again. So our uh, conclusion is collagen can impede phagocytosis um, and enzymatic breakdown of collagen can again promote phagocytosis. Um, we think this may have something to do with the uh, mechanics, like the mechanical change of biofilm. Um, so we measure the biofilm 
um, mechanic by this multiple particle tracking microbiology. So we um, grow biofilms with uh, the tracer particles in it. Um, so the tracer particles, they will be driven by the inherent uh, thermal energy. Um, it can reflect the uh, strain that's from the thermal stress of the biofilm. And um, it will move like this, and then we record the, the track and then calculate the mean square displacement. So using the mean square displacement, we can calculate the relative viscoelasticity. Um, so when this alpha relative viscoelasticity is one, that means the material is liquid. When it's zero, it means solid. And for biofilms, biofilms are viscoelastic material. That means they have uh, alpha between zero and one. So um, from my measurement, um, those are um, biofilm with or without collagen. So when the collagen biofilm increase, the biofilm be become more solid. Um, and when you use enzyme to break out to, to break down the, the collagen, um, it become more liquid, like even more liquid than th th than the control group. Mm. So, um, so, I, so I wonder how would that uh, happen? Um, I think there may be some microstructures formed in the bioforms. So I did this SEM imaging. So the, um, the first line is just bioform. Um, and this is with collagen. You can see there's very weird structure forming there, like a layer of something. It's like also a layer of something. Um, and when you use enzyme to break down collagen, the layer just disappear. So I don't know how, but um, we will explore more. Um, but I did multiple experiments and just found this layer of thing. And there's also major um, collagen fibers in the biofilms. I still the color idea to make it easier to see. Um, um, those fibers are like uh, are supporting the biofilm structure. Um, I also use uh, reflectance confocal microscopy. Um, to characterize the um, collagen inside biofilm. So bio, um, collagen tend to form a fiber that's very reflective. Um, so so when, when, you, um, when you are imaging them, they don't fluoresce, but they can reflect light. So you can see them. Um, so when, when there is just um, to the monocerogenosa, there is no collagen network. And where is, uh, when there is just collagen, you can see a network with a, without bacteria. Um, but when there is both bacteria and collagen, you can see um, bacteria form clusters around the fibers. And the fibers are less uh, than the control group. Um, I, in the future, I want to explore how this, how this network forms in the biofilms um, and how they um, use the collagen molecules um, to form the layer-like structure or form the fibers. I will use um, biomedical, uh, biochemical methods um, to figure out the polymer interaction, this, this kind of thing. So the conclusion is um, the take home points are your skin has collagen that can be incorporated by biofilms. Um, and this incorporated collagen in biofilms can impede phagocytosis and increase biofilm elasticity and form microstructures. Or when you use enzyme to break down collagen, it can promote the phagocytosis, lower the elasticity, and destroy the microstructures. That's all. Um, I want to acknowledge my lab and our collaborators and our funding source. We are recruiting grad students. We are very supportive and productive. I really love my group. Um, so please scan the QR code to visit our web, web page. If you happen to know someone applying to grad school, you can let them know. Um, thanks for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please email me, and this is, again, our QR code. Thank you, speaker. <laughs> any questions? Biofilm growing in, like, in the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients or on some surgical insects or whatever, like catheters, whatever they do in, in body environment, 
Do you expect to have so high collagen ratio in those? Uh, so uh, the previous results I showed uh, with our collaborator, so we actually use mouse, mouse tissue. Um, for the incorporated collagen, and um, yeah, there's actually mm, so so the the effect is similar to twenty percent collagen. That's why I'm using twenty percent collagen here. Any other question? Okay, uh, then we can uh, thank the speaker again. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. So, um, so the y-axis are um, alpha values. That's the relative viscoelasticity values. The higher it is, the more it's like a fluid. And the lower it is, it's more like solid. So um, from the alpha value of those strains, we can see um, how elastic or how, how viscous they are. What is treating? Yeah, what is the treating with? Oh, it's treated with collagenase. It's an enzyme that can break down collagen. Okay. So now we, now we are actually running out of time. So maybe we can unpack this uh, uh, offline. So. Um, Next speaker is um, Yuja Qi. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Yuja Qi. I'm a postdoc at the University of Genova. Um, so today I'll talk about sea anomaly spinning, uh, which is one of my interests on some of my other uh, subjects. So how do sea anomaly sting? Oh, okay. So they have... Um, a specialized cells called anamodocytes that can shoot out harpoon-like structures and inject poison into either the predator or the prey that they encountered. And these cells are very expensive to use, not only because they have complex structures, but also because they are single-use cells. So once they are triggered, they have to be used and disposed and re replenished again. So. Um, the number of the cells that trigger every time has to be strictly regulated. So we used um, optimal control theory to predict the optimal shooting as a function of the internal state of the starvation. And uh, we found that depending on the goal, the optimal shooting behavior differs. So if the anemone mini shoots for predation, then the optimal shooting will increase as the animal gets more starved. But if the animal mini shoots for the defense, then uh, its optimal shooting will keep uh, the same or even decrease a little bit. Uh, so we obtained these results theoretically using asymptotic methods. Uh, of course, I won't show the process here, but that is the result. And the key is that the trend of these results does not depend on the specifics of the parameters, which we proved theoretically as well. And we asked our collaborators at Harvard to validate our theory. So they actually found these two types of anemones, one many shoots for predation and the other one many shoots for defense because it can do photosynthesis. So they looked under the micro, uh, microscope and hand counted the number of uh, cells triggered at different stages of starvation. And they found uh, and their uh, experimental data fit our theoretical ones. Um, so what's next? Uh, the continuous limit uh, hamilton jacobi bellman equation, uh, there's no time to explain. Um, but uh, what else is interesting for, um, for the anomalies is despite them not even having a brain or a central nerve system, they can actually learn from experience. <clears throat> 
So if we just plunge these anomalies into a completely different environment, then we will expect the uh, curves we saw pro previously gradually change if they actually learn in that environment. Uh, so that's the potential next step for this project. Oh, and I have some other interests that includes macrovascular hydrodynamics, especially its structural and adaptational principles. For example, I found like there are low flow areas in the cortex that is uh, impossible to completely eliminate. Like those low flow areas are inherent uh, as a uh, as a result for the architecture for the uh, microvasculature in the cortex. And that, but minimizing that low flow region actually sets uh, an optimal ratio for the arterial to venue, which uh, we found very close to what we observed in nature. Uh, many people don't realize that the ratio of arterial to venue uh, varies a lot across different mammals. For example, in us humans that, and other primates, that ratio is close to 2.6 to 1, but for rodents, the ratio is the other way around. So why does that number even exist, or why is it different in different mammals? The, if you are interested, there's uh, an article of mine on PNS that you can read. Uh, another subject of mine uh, involves the uh, interaction between the red blood cells and the cell walls, and how that interaction uh, adapts the vessel's radii, and how the change of the vessel's radii in turn shifts the red blood cells distribution across the uh, zebra face trunk. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in different stages of development, the distribution of red blood cells changed uh, greatly, and that is not pathological at all. It is completely normal, and every zebra fish goes through this. So if you're also interested in that, there's another article of mine also on PNS that you can read. And finally, last but not least, I'm also interested in olfactory navigation, especially how memory changes the insect's searching behavior. And I found using um, reinforcement learning that the insect's behavior when it thinks it's lost varies when, when it has different memory lengths. Because if it doesn't, if, if it's not lost, then it will just go upwind. Uh, everything is easy, but if it's lost, that's when things start to get uh, interesting. Uh, that's all the time I ha have. Uh, thank you for listening. Let's thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Don't have time for questions, but uh, you can ask her uh, offline. So, uh, next speaker is uh, Davide Ber Bernardi. Oh, no, it didn't work. Okay. Yes, so. Hi, my name is Davide. I'm from the Laboratory of Interdisciplinary Physics in the University of Padova and the National Biodiversity Future Center. So I'm going to speak about spatially deserted environments that stabilize competitive meta-communities. So I guess the big question in the background here is how uh, what properties of landscapes can support biodiversity? That would be the ability of... Uh, support uh, coexistence of different species. So to address this question in a model, we started from a set of microscopic equations for individuals belonging to different species, uh, which live in a set of spatial patches. So a patch would be some uh, uh, landscape element with some degree of spatial segregation. You can think of them as islands, if you wish. So individual can uh, just die or give birth to explorers that then would diffuse through some network and explore the environment until they try and can settle other patches. And since resources and space is limited, and uh, they have to compete for that. Under the hypothesis that exploration is fast compared to the birth and death dynamics, we can derive a set of um, effective equations for the fraction of space in patch I occupied by species alpha. This uh, will decrease with a rate which can be in general dependent both on the species and patch and increase from the colonization influx, which is uh, described by this kernel K, which summarizes the effect of all possible paths connecting patch J to patch I. The colonization term is multiplied by the free space 
um, which is, um, causes competition between species. So it turns out that in homogeneous landscapes, co coexistence is possible only in a very fine-tuned scenario. That is, when all species have identical average fitness, so it would be on this black line here. In general, other than complete extinction, what you typically see is monodominance, that is, one species takes over, and this is in general not only for two species, but for any number of species. However, if landscapes are heterogeneous, then stable coexistence is possible. In the mean field case, we showed analytically that there exists a um, critical landscape disorder strength above which stable coexistence is guaranteed. So this coexistence boundary here uh, depends on this factor gamma, which uh, quantifies how heterogeneous species are. And that means that uh, species that are more, that, that uh, are, um, whose average fitness is uh, uh, more diverse uh, needs stronger disorder in order to have them coexist. And we understood the mechanism underlying the stable coexistence as the spontaneous formation of uh, niches. And indeed, if, if you compute the localization of species, you see that it goes up, it increases sizably in the coexistence phase. Going beyond mean field, you, we, uh, you can consider the effect of different topology of the dispersal network and see that in general they enhance coexistence. For instance, if you go from the mean field to a random network or to a, a preferential attachment network with hubs or shortcuts in small world networks, the number and the total population of coexistence species go up and they can support more heterogeneous species. So finally, we can, uh, you can consider other kind of generalizations, for instance, the spatial disorder, correlation in the spatial disorder or more realistic terrestrial or river networks. You can read this up in the paper before giving you the reference. I will acknowledge all the people who worked on this. So Prajwal Patmanab and Giorgio Nicoletti, who recently moved from Padova to Lausanne, then Samir Suárez and Sandra Anzaele, also from the LIF lab in Padova, Andrea Rinaldo for the, from the EPFL, and last but not least, um, Amos Maritan, also from Panama. Thank you. Thank you, Davide. Okay, if, if there's... An, uh, sorry, what? Oh, uh, can, you, can you speak up? Uh, to, Yes. Yes. I, yes. So in all of this is for the limit of fast exploration. So it's a basically separation of time scales. So it's this this fast degree of freedom is uh, is average. It's not averaged out, but uh, you can can read the calculations in the paper, but. It's in the limit where exploration is fast. But the topology does bear an impact. It's, it's, it's very, whoops, it's, uh, it's, it's in this kernel here. But, but uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, further discussion can be taken offline. Let's thank uh, David again. And, uh, let's welcome Will Showmaker. Which, which one? You have two, right? No, I just uploaded one. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, you can maybe just... Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay, so I think that a lot of people in this uh, group would agree with the statement that microorganisms constitute one of the most successful forms of life on the planet. They seem to have astounding phylogenetic, metabolic, taxonomic, and functional breadth and contribute towards major uh, processes and cycles that sustain life on the planet for macrobes. Uh, and that empirical diversity and seeming complexity that we see in nature, I mean, I think it's a challenge for uh, myself, I'm a, I do my career with college and evolution, is to try and understand central principles that describe, um, uh, you know, the broad patterns that we can get in, in 
in the lab and in nature. And so one of the, and so one of the ways to do this is through the concept of effective models, where you just try to get the core features of your system and emit details that are not particularly relevant to your question. And one of I think the most successful examples of this in recent years is the work. Uh, led by Terry Wands, that where instead of uh, caring about the entire network of metabolic interactions, you take coarse grain into proteomes that do different functions, and from that you can describe uh, reproducible empirical relationships, such as in this case the relationship between growth rate and the fraction of the proteome that goes to ribosomes. And so I'd argue that we have something similar in ecology, thanks to mass amounts of sequence data, and this is work from uh, Jacopo Grilli demonstrating how if you just go into a given environment, so say you sequence a bunch of human guts and you pick a single species, in this case we use uh, amplicon sequence variants or operational taxonomic units, and you look at the abundance of that species in different hosts and plot the distribution, you get something that looks like a gamma distribution. And if you do that again and again and again for different species, you keep getting this similar distribution, and if you properly rescale by the mean invariance, everything tends to collapse, and it collapses for all the environments that you examine. Uh, and so this empirical thing we observed in, or that they can be observed in natural communities can also be recapitulated in experimental communities. This is just an example from um, a preprint I have with um, Jacopo and uh, Alvaro Sanchez looking at community assembly experiments, doing similar investigations and showing how you can get back uh, major macroecological patterns that we would observe in nature in the lab on minimal communities with a single supplied carbon source. And this is just an example of that here, a little bit of a deviation in the probability distribution for the tail. But overall, you can get the bulk of the distribution regardless of, uh, in this case, different treatments of migration uh, back in a uh, community setting or experimental setting. And so, you know, that's an experiment. We could even go lower than this 16S ASV OTU scale and ask about the finest scale of the, that's nowadays con continued, uh, considered to be the finest scale of diversity, and that's this sub 16S strain structure. And so, in this collaboration I had at UCLA, we looked at the dynamics of strains within a single human host over time. You can plot that distribution over time and do it for a bunch of different strains, a bunch of different hosts, it all tends to collapse again, and it all can be described by gamma distribution. Similarly, in a solo offer effort, I went out and investigated whether or not you can get strain dynamics of similar uh, distributions when you go for a single, species, single strain across hosts. And this is, there's no strain inference here, it's just using uh, allele frequencies that are greater than zero and less than one, and you can get back the same shape. And so, Within a host and across hosts, you, uh, at the strain level, you can get the same thing you observe at the 16S or species level. And so that's the finest scale. And in experiments, a lot of people will coarse grain their, uh, the abundances of community members using, either the, using the taxonomy. And so this is often done to just make things simpler. There's only so many colors you can plot, uh, right, for ASV level take maybe a higher taxonomic level like the family level and you look at that and you can start to see some patterns of, okay, these are likely the important, functionally important taxa and then you can go and confirm that with experiments. And so we were asking, what is the right scale for ecology, specifically macroecology, and is there even one? And so we identified a few questions. The first was asking, can we define a quantitative coarse grading axis using the phylogeny instead of taxonomy, right? You can really only get five or six points on your x-axis um, with the taxonomy, with phylogeny, you can go as sort of fine scale as you want, more or less. Um, second is this operation that people do in the experiments and in, and in uh, data from natural systems alter broad macroecological patterns. And third, how do these fine and coarse grain scales relate to one another? So, for the first one, yes, fairly straightforward. There's many ways you can define it. We just defined, okay, you have some threshold on the tree and everything below that, where you, where you uh, laid down that marker, that's now one uh, community member, one coarse grain species. And so this observation of the gamma, you can then connect that to um, effect, this effective model of the stochastic logistic model of growth where you have self-limiting deterministic growth plus environmental noise, also known as linear multiplicative noise. From that, the stationary solution that is the gamma distribution we observe in nature. We can account for sampling by taking the convolution of that distribution in Poisson sampling. And so from that, we get you know, our distribution of read counts, right? Because we don't observe actual abundances when we do sequencing, we get read counts back off of some, uh, what we believe to be some relative abundance that's out there. 
And of this distribution that we get back, this negative binomial, can be used to derive and test predictions that explicitly account for sampling, defined as the total number of reads in your sequencing efforts. And so when we do this, you just go in, in this case, looking at the human gut from uh, the 16S data from the Earth Microbiome Project, plot the distributions at different coarse grain scales using the phylogeny, and everything tends to collapse on the left plot. Um, on the right plot here, we're looking at the relationship between the mean abundance and the fraction of communities where a given community member is present, so also known as occupancy. And so the point here is that the curves tend to collapse regardless of your coarse grain scale indicated by the, uh, uh, the, the color blue here. And so you can derive predictions using the distributions that we know to capture this, uh, you know, things at the 16S Asphere OTU level. And so we can derive predictions for the average richness at a given coarse grain scale, as well as Shannon's diversity. And when we compare these observed and predicted measures, we see that things tend to work out. This particular uh, example I'm showing you, the x-axis is just your degree of coarse graining. Your y-axis is either the richness or diversity. And this is all with the human gut. And so we can take this, and we can do this with a whole bunch of different environments in the Earth Microbiome Project and plot the predicted versus the observed and see that it all tends to work out. Our predictions tend to be doing fairly well for predicting average diversity or an average richness. And so we've done pretty well at predicting things at one scale, at least for expected values, right? Variances are a different story. How do the fine grain communities relate to coarse grain communities? And so this has been asked in a slightly different way a few years back um, in this eLife paper from Jesse Shapiro's group call, where they describe something, well, they uh, characterize what's called in the literature in the past as the diversity begets diversity hypothesis. This is this primarily uh, conceptual idea that diversity at some scale um, will lead to diversity at some other scale or some other measure. In this particular instance, they're applying to 16S data. So what you're doing is you're looking at the richness of your coarse grain community versus the richness of the, of the, um, at the fine scale. And the measure they use is a little more complicated than that. We, we account for it fully in our, um, our analyses, but just for the point of thinking of it, it's coarse versus fine, and there's a slope that's positive. And so the interpretation is that this positive slope that they had in the paper is driven by interactions between community members. And that was determined that this slope is, non, is non-trivial by comparing it to the results of uh, simulations of a specific form of neutral theory. And so this is, I think, where uh, an important assumption because uh, neutral theory does pretty well for a variety of organisms. It can even do well for certain uh, microbes in the ocean, but it doesn't tend to do well for the broad microbial macroecological patterns, say, in the human gut. And so to test this, three steps basically, we do the same predictions that we talked about earlier at the fine and coarse grain scale, fit a slope, just ordinary linear regression between the fine and coarse grain scales, and then plot the predicted slopes. And so each dot represents a single community member here. And this is at a single coarse grain scale. And so we're doing a pretty good job getting back the slopes that we, can, that we get from fitting uh, the data. Um, so what we can do from here is then take the mean of that x-axis and the mean of that y-axis, right? And so this is uh, the data point at one coarse grain scale in the human gut repeat that process for all the coarse grain scales in all the environments. And we do a pretty good job getting things on the one-to-one -one line. And so the takeaway we think here is that interactions, right, we're working with a uh, stationary solution that accounts for sampling of an effective model that does not have explicit interactions between community members. There could be mean field, but there's no pairwise interactions or anything like that. And so the interactions are not necessary to explain this macroecological pattern that was presented. You can get it back with uh, the interpretation of a stochastic logistic model. But this is in richness. What about diversity? So everything fails. Uh, slopes completely. Uh, we cannot get the slope back at all with the same predictions we talked about earlier. And so the idea we had is that interactions matter for measures of communities composition that depend on the entire range of abundances, right? Richness is basically presence absence. The species is there or it isn't. Here with something like Shannon's diversity, you're using the whole species abundance distribution in each site. And so interactions require to explain diversity. Interactions are hard to infer. We just took the empirical correlation matrix and did simulations with gamma distributions and we basically got it back. That's, that's but in a sense that's not entirely impressive. That's the whole distribution, but at minimum it sort of explains when correlations are necessary to get back this uh, pattern that was presented in the past literature. And so the key here, however, we think is that um, 
correlations do not point to a singular ecological mechanism, right? Alternative uh, uh, mechanisms can give rise to the same correlation value. And so some mechanisms are likely more likely than others. Um, explicit interactions have often not been necessarily required to explain a broad array of macroecological patterns we can see in the data, specifically this recent work, work with uh, Matteo Sorecci, working with Jacopo Grilli and others on how you can explain the relationship between phylogenetic distance and correlation between community members based off, a, a, based off of a competition for resources that are fluctuating in the environment where there's no explicit interaction between community members. And so the take home here um, is that we can make a lot of progress with minimal tractable models that don't require a ton of interactions or parameters. Uh, I think something that's this audience is very appreciative of, but it's sometimes understated in ecologies that null does not mean neutral. And uh, we think that there's hints of scale and variance in these microbial macroecological patterns that we've investigated. And so I'd like to thank Jacopo and all the fine folks at ICTP. Let's have a couple of questions. Yes, Joshua. Yes. I looked at a full alternative uh, measures of diversity, like Simpson's diversity and, and a few others, as well as trying to look at evenness, the getting the expected value of evenness was a bit difficult because you're taking the expectation of a ratio versus, and you really have to approximate that as the ratio of expectations. One of the limiting things um, for getting different measures of the slope was that I had to numerically integrate, uh, that, that term under the integral had to be numerically integrated for each community member in each site at each coarse grain scale in each environment. And so I ended up doing something like 50 million numerical integrations on, a, on my old uh, IU supercomputer access. So um, that was the limiting fact for doing the full sweep, but things seem to hold out with just a few, no way prior reason to select these, but just random samples and then trying to get back the predictions. Excellent talk. I was wondering if you've looked at those long time series that Eric Arm had connected and yep. looking at things like Hurst exponent and do they also coarse grain as a function of taxonomy? That's a good idea. All of this um, today is in the interpretation of, I, I, you have to take a basically an ensemble approach where, uh, yeah, you basically have to take an ensemble approach for all this because these are more or less independent sites for each environment, but we have looked at a little bit of time series data for the human gut, and that's a good idea to look at that. Sorry, so I opened the studio where you need the correlation to explain diversity, like, uh, did you try? To, to explain yeah. the relationship between diversity at different coarse grain scales. Yeah, okay, but did you try to diagonalize the correlation matrix uh, and uh, to see what is there, like? Uh, what features of the correlation matrix are necessary? To diagonalize it, to see if there are some independent, uh, you know, you can diagonalize the correlation matrix. Um, I, not for the slope, I did do a, we had this uh, null coarse graining procedure and I used it to identify like at what coarse graining scale the primary eigenvalue of the empirical correlation matrix is within this null distribution where things were randomly coarse grained together versus coarse grain using phylogenetic information. But I did not, do anything with that for this paper. Okay, let's thank uh, William again. Thanks.